Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this side session of the Conference of States Parties. Uh, my name is Connie Lauren Bowie. I'm the Executive Director of Inclusion International, and I'm really pleased today to be here for this session uh, called Deinstitutionalization, Canada's Experience Lessons Learned. Uh, a few housekeeping items uh, just to start us off, and I'm speaking slowly as I'm watching the number of participants growing quickly. Um, we do have captioning available for participants today. On the bottom right hand side of your screen, you will see live transcript. If you press that button, uh, you'll be able to uh, press show subtitles or full transcript. Both of those will give you captioning as the presenters are speaking. We also have sign language interpretation available today um, and you will see the sign language interpreters come onto the screen uh, at various points in the presentations. Uh, later, this, this session is being recorded and later in the session, you, there will be an opportunity for question and answer. And I'll repeat this later when we get to the question and answer section. But if you look at the bottom right-hand side of your screen again, you'll see a Q and A box. And if you click on that, you will be able to submit questions for the panelists. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today uh, with a very impressive uh, list of panelists. Earlier this week, the Conference of States Parties opened um, with various dignitaries talking about issues that we still need to address to ensure the human rights of people with disabilities. The UN Special Rapporteur, um, Gerard Quinn said that we have to address this issue of institutions that we've been battling for decades and that it's time to stop spending our money on systems that no longer work or never did work for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, I'm really pleased that we have an opportunity to hear about Canada's particular experience over the past uh, several decades in the closure of institutions uh, in that country. And I think that there are many uh, participants joining us who are anxious to hear about the lived experience um, and, and the process of closure in Canada with uh, both the challenges and the success stories that have happened in Canada. So I'm really pleased again to welcome you all. Um, I would like to turn the floor over at this moment to Robin Acton, President of Inclusion International and Corey Earle, President of People First of Canada who will provide the land acknowledgement and introduction. Good afternoon. My name is Robin Acton and I am the president of Inclusion Canada, formerly the Canadian Association for Community Living. Inclusion Canada works to advance the full inclusion and human rights of people with an intellectual disability and their families. And we have been active in the area of deinstitutionalization for more than 50 years. I want to start by taking a moment to acknowledge that Canada resides on the unceded territories of many nations and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. An acknowledgement of country means visitors or anyone who is not from this land recognize the original people of the land both in the past and the present. I would like now to, I would now like to take a moment for us all to remember who we are, where we are standing and how we should proceed. In concert with People First of Canada and Inclusion International, we are very pleased to sponsor this event and to share some of the many learnings we have accrued as a result of our previous and ongoing efforts directed towards deinstitutionalization and community living in Canada. During this session, you will hear from members of the Inclusion Canada, People First of Canada Joint Task Force on deinstitutionalization, several members of whom are institution survivors themselves and will share their lived experiences. During this session, we will share with you what we view as the essential elements of a deinstitutionalization process, a process that when undertaken correctly 
enables persons with an intellectual disability to leave inappropriate institutional facilities and take their rightful place within community. A process that must be genuine, focused on the person and their choices and dreams, and one that must ultimately enable a typical life in community. We know that institutions represent a denial of basic human rights. We know that persons with an intellectual disability have told us loudly and continuously that they do not wish to live in institutions, that they have the right to live fully within community, to be fully included in community. We believe there is an obligation on all countries to ensure that this demand is met. We believe there is a collective obligation to fully meet the rights as outlined in Article 19 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. As we listen to the panelists in this session and understand the imperative to close institutions, we must also be mindful of the fact that deinstitutionalization is about more than just closing institutions. It is also about ensuring that the necessary supports and services are available in the community so that persons can be supported to live typical and inclusive lives and to ensure that future generations of persons with an intellectual disability are not forced into institutional living. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Robin, for that. Um, I want to welcome everyone here today and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Corey Earl. I am the president of Pew First Canada. Pew First Canada is a national organization representing people labeled with an intellectual or developmental disabilities in Canada. For 30 years, People First has been advocating to close institutions in our country. It is the very core of this organization. Our movement is built from survivors of these horrible places. The United Nations has also said this. In 2006, the United Nations developed the Convention on the Right of People with Disabilities, or the CRPD, as it is often referred to. Article 19 of the CRPD is about living independently and being included in the community. It states that we have the right to choose where we want to live and from whom we want to live with. It states, it states that we are not obligated to live in a particular living arrangement. It also states we have the right to the necessary supports to help us live and be included in the community. When we talk about the institutionalization plan in Canada, it is guided by values and principles that we know will achieve a positive outcome for people. This plan must ensure that transition plans are individualized for each and every person, and that the person directs and controls that plan. The plan must be respectful of people's rights to make choices and to take risks. The plan must also be included uh, the right to support as needed from family, friends, and advocate to assist in decision making. We call we call that supported decision making. Today, we're, you are going to hear information about the right way to support um, as people move out of institutions. You're also going to hear stories about how this transition can go can go wrong. We hope that everyone takes these lessons to heart and that we do not rest until everyone, I mean everyone, is able to live independently and be included in a community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Corey, and thank you, Robin. I'd now like to introduce um, Ambassador Bob Ray, Permanent Representative Designate of Canada to the United Nations. Welcome, Ambassador, and thank you so much for being with us. We have a very large audience for this side session, and we're really pleased to have you with us. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to attend, and I, I may have to do an emergency uh, process with my computer here just to make sure it doesn't run out of gas. Just a second. So 
Ambassador, your your video is not on. Yeah, I think that's a reflection of something. Let me just see. I see. Let me just take care of this for just one yeah. moment. No worries. It's the joy of being on Zoom all day. That's right. <laughs> I'm hoping I can get this fixed. Um, it's a little bit like trying to find the conference room you're supposed to be at the UN. So now we found you. <laughs> now, now you found me, and I'm and I'm and I'm now rehooked to my uh, to my uh, battery. So I'm good. Nice to see you, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for uh, letting me join you. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to say just a few words in uh, in um, in anticipation of this meeting. Um, I I, I was delighted to get the invitation to uh, to speak to this group, and of course, uh, it, it stems from my my uh, when you talk about you know trying to assess the Canadian experience. Um, I am officially obliged to say that the federal government um, has a role and the provincial governments have a role, but I thought what I would do is just talk a little bit about our experiences and my experience as a politician in Ontario, uh, because um, I was, if you like, uh, present at the, at the very early days of, uh, of, this, uh, of the policy as it was uh, enunciated by, first of all, by Premier Davis, and then by Premier Peterson, and then by me, and then carried on by my successors in a variety of ways, focusing particularly on this issue of, of, of people with developmental disabilities. Although, as we know, there are people who have both physical and, and developmental disabilities. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenging area that, uh, to be perfectly honest, when I went into politics, I didn't know very much about. My only experience prior to that time had been that uh, with my parents, I visited the Smith Falls um, institution. There were three large, very large provincial institutions um, uh, in Ontario, one in Orillia, one in um, Cedar Springs near, uh, near Windsor, and one in Smith Falls uh, for Eastern Ontario. And the Smith Falls Institution was literally a 19th century institution, as were the other two large, huge places we were there to visit the, the uh, son of a friend of my parents who was also overseas because my father was a diplomat. My father said we'd go and see. And I have to confess, it was, a, it was a, for a young kid of 13, it was, it was quite, a, quite a shocking um, experience. Uh, and and it, was, um, it, was very, it was, it never left me. But I didn't know anything about it politically until I, I got into provincial politics. And Mr. Davis approached me personally to say, uh, this is a very important part of, of the, what the province wants to do. Uh, you need to understand that it's um, highly emotional, very charged. Uh, there are families that are in favor. There are families that are opposed. Uh, there's a union issue uh, because of the large number of uh, public employees who work in these big institutions. There were more than a thousand employees in each institution. There were thousands of people in each of these big institutions. And the, the plan has really evolved over a long period of time. But I, I think it's, I wanna stress a couple of things about the process. The first is that um, to give credit where credit is due, uh, Mr. Davis had a vision and had a sense of what he wanted to do that really stemmed from his own personal experience. He very much believed that these large institutions were the wrong place for people to be, and that as disruptive and difficult as it might be to change, uh, it was worse to keep on going. Um, and he was very much moved by um, a number of family experiences and family friends who said, we really have to find a better place and better choices for our families and for for our children, we don't accept that this is the only choice. Um, David Peterson was part of that conversation. Um, and as much as possible, although not entirely successfully, we tried to keep politics out of it because there were many political forces at work in the province that said that, well, uh, it's a nice idea, but in reality, uh, the families don't wanna do it and the employees don't wanna do it. And, and the, the clients don't want to do it, so leave, leave them where they are. 
We then created a number of uh, provincial institutions that were much smaller, but essentially we were trying to find options uh, like group homes, like building on the, the community supports that were coming from a number of, um, of community-based organizations that were ready and willing to accept um, new, new families and new clients as, uh, as residents. And um, a couple of things come out of this for me. One is, um, I think good leadership can sometimes get you somewhere. Uh, I think that uh, the second is, is that you, you, you must never see this as a money saving exercise. And we all must also remember that it's part of a wider set of questions around the appropriateness of institutional settings for seniors, uh, for people with broader disabilities, um, uh, for those who are mentally, uh, mentally ill, uh, and, and how um, we have to find uh, institutional or we have to provide supports that are at least as good as, if and better than, the, the financial supports that are provided to the institutions. One of the ironies is, is that it costs tens of thousands of dollars a day to keep somebody in an institution, but governments are very reluctant to spend anything close to that for people who are living in smaller places and, 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 and other, other places living at home, uh, living in circumstances that they want to, living in, uh, living in apartments. Um, how do we provide the supports for people the answer is by recognizing that that's their choice. Um, and the deinstitutionalization is not about a cost cutting exercise. It's a, it's a way of actually finding the best possible place for people to live. We're, we're, um, we've been an over institutionalizing country. That's true of Canada. And it's taken a lot of political effort in different provinces and, and uh, across the federal jurisdiction to get that to change. And I think we have to see this as a journey that is continuing. It's not over, uh, it's ongoing. Uh, and I think it's very important for us to, to learn lessons, to listen to the voices of, of people who've experienced the change themselves, of their families, uh, and what more needs to be done as we go forward. Finally, I think COVID-19 has taught us all a big lesson that uh, the big institutions or institutions of any size can be a real problem when it comes to the spread of, uh, of the virus. And, and also uh, can, we can see that because people with, with disabilities are frequently more, more vulnerable to the virus, uh, we've seen an, a, a completely unacceptable uh, uh, death rate in, uh, in the institutions as a result of COVID-19. And I think this is forcing a big, a big rethink at the provincial level and at the federal level. And I think that's good. I think it's long overdue. I think we need to be involved in this path together and also understand that it has a very important international component because um, every country in the world is experiencing this, but with different capacities and different means. So part of our job as Canadians is to understand that we're not alone in this, um, that other countries, sometimes do it better and many countries don't do it as well. So we need to learn from all those combined experiences. But I really much appreciate the chance to, to be with you and to say a few words and uh, to say how much I'm looking forward to uh, being able to listen to some of this discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And thank you for your leadership um, in the early days of this journey. And thank you for using your platform at the United Nations to gain attention to this issue, as you say, across uh, the disability rights movement, but also uh, other communities of people uh, like seniors who've, who we've recently seen the impact uh, because of COVID. Um, and we're happy if you're able to, to uh, join us for the conversation, I think you'll find the experiences of the panelists really interesting um, and compelling. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce the panelists. I want to just repeat for those of you who've joined us um, in, in the last little while, uh, over the next hour, we're going to have panelists from the Joint Task Force on Deinstitutionalization who will provide brief presentations on institutionalization and the deinstitutionalization process. 
The panel will be followed by a brief Q&A and that will be open to all attendees. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit the questions in the Q&A box and we will have a team of people watching uh, those questions to try to collect them and present them to the speakers. I'd like to now introduce our first panelists, Norm McLeod and Gordon Fletcher, who are co-chairs of People First of Canada and Inclusion Canada's Joint Task Force on Deinstitutionalization. Thank you both, Norm and Gordon. Thank you. The Right Way document presents principles and key elements for planning for closure of an institution. It is based on lessons learned in Canada and elsewhere over the last 50 years. The title, The Right Way, was chosen not to suggest a single correct approach, but to emphasize that's how an institution, but to emphasize that how an institution is closed is just as important as the imperative that all institutions must close. The task force identified the following 10 elements that help ensure successful closure of institutions. First slide, please. Element one, involve, involve champions for community living. Canada's, Canada's experience demonstrates that the decision to close an institution and embrace community living requires vision, passion, leadership, and champions. Sorry. Champions have come from every sector of society, from the volunteer sector, advocacy organizations, from community living agencies, from inside the institutions and from within government. Family members and people with disabilities are most often the initial champions, demanding both institution closures and the development of community supports. They have dared to dream a dream of equal citizenship for people with disabilities, where they become valued contributing members of our society. They demand, they demand their, their fellow citizens be free from institutions and be supported to live good lives in their communities. <clears throat> Next slide, please. The second element that um, we identified was to ensure the needs and preferences of the person come first. The closure of an institution is primarily a process of creating responsive, individualized supports and services that will enable each person to live in their own home, to engage in meaningful activity in the community and make decisions about their own life. Each person must be empowered to choose where and with whom to live and their living arrangements must truly be that person's home, not a facility, not a workplace, and not a place where arbitrary rules or the needs of staff or others come first. Planning should be seen as an ongoing and a not a one-time process. Funding should be individualized and attached to the person so that if they need to move or want to move, they will be free to do so and not trapped in a government agency controlled funding model. Next slide, next slide, please. Element three, respect the experiences and roles of families. In the past, families were routinely advised that institutional placement was best for their son or daughter and for their family. In some cases, families were told their child's health was fragile or that they would only live for a short time. Some healthcare professionals told families to forget about their child and move on with their lives. It should be expected then 
that some families will be distrustful and feel a sense of betrayal when professionals now tell them institutions are no longer needed or that they will never, they were never appropriate places for people to live. Some families may fear that they will become solely responsible for their son or daughter's care or that their loved one may be dumped into inferior an inferior living situation or even be at risk of homelessness. For these and many other reasons, families should be informed and involved from the outset. <laughs> families are often the best source of information about, in the, about the person and will often form the nucleus of the person's support in the community. Next slide, please. The fourth element that we identified, facilitate person-centered plans and, and create a real home for each person. Individualized person-centered planning facilitated by an independent facilitator will help ensure that each person moves to their own home in the community. Like everyone else, some individuals will choose to live on their own with supports while some may choose to live with others for practical or personal reasons. Services must be based on the individual needs and preferences of the person being supported. Predetermined service models and living arrangements based on the perceived needs of a group simply replicate the institutional model on a smaller scale. Such models are often presented as innovated, but this is extremely misleading. Innovation per se is not the goal. The goal is to support the individual in ways that meet their needs and allow them to live in a real home, to participate meaningful in community life, to make real choices and have their rights and wishes respected. Next slide, please. Element five, create quality support services and safeguards. It is essential that dedicated transitional funding be allocated to support people as they make their transition to community. When the institution closes, funding previously allocated to the institutions should be reallocated to communities. Our experience has shown that supporting people to live inclusive lives in the community is no more expensive than funding institutions and outcomes for people are vastly improved. Policies and strategies for monitoring the quality of services and establishing safeguards must be built into the closure process. The most important outcome is the extent to which the wishes, preferences, and needs of each individual are being addressed. The individual and their family and friends will clearly be in the best position to judge where they live. And it is their point where, whether it's their home, whether they're able to make real choices or feel included in their community, and whether they feel that their rights and wishes are being respected. It is also important to evaluate the deinstitutionalization process itself. The results of such an evaluation should indicate what went well and what might have been done differently. This information will be useful for government and community leaders involved in the closure and also for leaders planning institutional closures in other jurisdictions. Next slide, please. Element number six, recruit and develop qualified uh, support staff, one of the most important factors in the success of closing institutions and developing community supports is the availability of skilled, knowledgeable employees to provide the individualized supports needed by people. Government and community leaders must develop plans to address staffing issues related to both the creation of person-centered community supports and the closure of institutions. 
it is essential to involve employees and unions early in the process, not to negotiate the decision to close the institution, but to demonstrate respect for the impact of the closure on institution staff and to offer opportunities to work in partnership to make the transition as positive as possible for all concerned. Training opportunities must be for provided for both institutional staff and prospective employees in the communities to which individuals plan to move. By redeploying staff who are well suited to work in new capacities within community, resistance to the closure of the institution will probably be reduced. Next slide, please. Element number seven, establish community partnerships. The successful closure of an institution depends on sound collaborative working partnerships between individuals, families, government, and community organizations. These partners must work together to ensure that service planning is truly person-centered and individualized, that the rights and choices of each individual remain paramount, and that adequate, appropriate, personalized community support and services are planned and secured. The assistance and support of a broad and diverse array of individuals and organizations is critical to ensuring a clear and informed message that the closure of institutions has community support and is in the best interest of individuals with intellectual disabilities and society. Next slide, please. Element number eight, establish a clear plan and time frame for closing the institution. A clear public policy supporting community living should be established by government to provide the foundation for the right of people with an intellectual disability to live in community and to send a clear message that institutional models will no longer be supported by public policy or funds. Government and community leaders must share a clear, unequivocal public commitment that the institution will be closed, that resources will be allocated to the community, and that planning will ensure that each person residing in the institution will be supported to move to their own home in the community. Many Canadian jurisdictions have begun by making a fundamental decision to stop all admissions to the institution. This ensures that a community-based response becomes mandatory. A clear time frame for completing the process for closing the institution is essential. Next slide, please. Element number nine, communicate the announcement clearly and effectively. Once a decision has been made to close the institution, careful consideration must be given to how the decision is announced and how the messages related to the closure and plans for creating individualized supports for people in the community will be conveyed. It should be expected that there will be at least some opposition to the closure. Typically, opposition has come from a few family members concerned that their son or daughter cannot be supported adequately in the community and from unions or community leaders concerned about job losses and economic impacts on communities where the institution operates. In anticipation of these and other concerns, government and community leaders must be well prepared for clear information about what is planned and why the decision is in everyone's best interest, especially the interests and rights of citizens with intellectual disabilities. Next slide, please. So our, our final element is carefully coordinate supports for each person's transition to the community. The planning of each person's transition to the community must be individualized. Each person's individualized plan must have identified such basic things as where and with whom the person will live, what kinds of supports and services they will need, and how these will be provided. 
what kinds of activities the person wants to engage in at home and in the community. The physical move of people to the community needs to be carefully orchestrated. The people who know the person well will be in the best position to help plan the transition. Whatever process is decided upon, the transition period is an extension of the person's individualized plan and must be approached with care and attention to the unique needs of the individual. Thank you. That concludes our portion of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Norman and Gordon. Um, really helpful to have very concrete elements to share with our audience and participants. Um, and I, I will just mention before I introduce the next, next speaker that we have 177 participants listening to our uh, panelists today. Um, and I think what you've just offered is some very concrete um, steps that people in different countries uh, can look to as they are thinking about either beginning this journey or wherever they are in their own journey in their own countries. Um, our next speakers uh, are Gloria Mahuzier. I'm sorry, Gloria, if I've got your last name mispronounced. Uh, Gloria is a board member of Inclusion Canada and a task force member. And Janet Forbes, who's the executive director of Inclusion Winnipeg. Welcome both and thank you. Unmuting and microphones on. I, I think my yeah, mine's on yeah. and my there we go. Now we can hear you, Gloria. Thank you. Yeah. Is my video on? Yes. Yes. Okay. We can see okay. you and hear you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I come to you from Saskatchewan, Canada. Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. I've been asked to share my experience sitting on the Valley View Transition Steering Committee. Uh, the Valley View Centre in Saskatchewan, Canada was an 1100 person capacity institution that closed its doors in 2019. Next slide, please. This was a process seven years in the making. In the end, uh, 153 individuals transitioned out of Valley View Center. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the importance of involving champions, having person-centered planning and involving families when moving people out of an institution. Our committee was guided by the successful elements of the Right Way publication that you just listened to. And I'm going to focus on three of those elements. Next slide, please. We found that our champions, the government of Saskatchewan and co-chairs of the Valley View Family Group shared our vision and worked very hard to make sure the transition was done properly for everyone that lived in the institution. The acceptance of the 14 recommendations created by the committee signified our government's commitment to ensure all individuals living at the Valley View Centre would continue to have auxiliary services in the community they chose to live in for their future home. This acceptance also confirmed commitment that no individual would leave the Valley View Centre until services were in place that would meet the individual's unique support needs. Next slide, please. The project team of government employees was developed under the transition committee. Inadequate resources and upset families and the pressure to initiate planning right away made the project's team very difficult. And because of the nature of the closing, it was difficult to establish concrete times and communication really suffered. When these situations were resolved, the project team became a champion. Also, the staff at the center continued to support each person when they said goodbye to a place that they had lived in for many years and then helped them welcome their new home adventure and their new supports. We also met with mayors and city planners to discuss transi transition plans in the building of 38 new homes in different communities all around our province. And more began to support us and know that the process will be driven 
by the needs of the individuals. At the start, it wasn't easy for the group. Lots of time was spent clarifying roles and responsibilities. There was little involvement and trust from the staff. Our messaging and communication to the public and stakeholders groups needed to improve so we could have a better picture of what actually was happening. So we learned very early that collaboration provided the group with opportunities to expand our horizons and think outside the box. Next slide, please. Um, I think maybe we're with slide behind. Yeah, there we go. Prior to starting the person, the process of person-centered planning, the champions, members of our government, members of the Valley View family group, and members of Inclusion Saskatchewan did research for residential options. These research trips went really well as the group took a chance to look at other best practices in Western Canada was a short, short research trip, and it would have been helpful to have some more time at some of the places to gather more information on how to support individuals with complex needs. We were a passionate group of individuals with a sincere desire to gather information for the closure. We met families with very high medical needs living in the community. We met people who lived through the transition process, and we learned from them. This information was shared with all our champions and then the planning started. Next slide, please. Our preparation for person-centered planning was originally impacted by lack of resources. Plan B, which was included adding resources, planning a schedule, having project milestones very clearly communicated at our regular meetings was a great benefit. We built a person-centered matrix for the center, so no one would be missed or left behind. Once the process started, we took careful planning that every person that moved out of Valley View had a transition plan where their families were at the table. Now around this table, they made choices about their future, which included who they wanted to live with, where they wanted to live, and how they were going to live. We had moved people within our province of Saskatchewan, as well as to Alberta, and as well as British Columbia. I remember that during one planning, we had an individual who wanted to move to British Columbia to be with his sister. Of course, some of our government folks were opposed to someone leaving the province. Uh, no one had done that, wasn't in the plan. However, because the transition team was true to the vision and the process of person-centered planning, the question ended up to be, why not? Why can't he move with his sister two provinces away? And in the end, all champions rallied towards making it happen. And he's now with his sister in British Columbia. And I will add, he's been to vacations to Mexico and California with the family. So with this type of planning, everyone knew what was going to come and all had the courage to do the right thing. The person-centered approach put the individuals and the families at the front of every discussion and every decision. Next slide, please. Oops, we are went ahead, but that's okay. When we told the families about the closing of where their loved ones had lived, some for over 50 years, they were very angry at us for bringing the news. They did not believe that their loved ones would have the same level of care in the community as they did in the institution. We tried to assure them that their quality of life would be better living in the community. It took us seven years to convince families that this would be better for their loved ones. And the fearful unknown of the closure of Valley View turned into a situation full of dreams and possibilities. And this came true for each person and their families. Having the Valley View Center family group as a champion was an asset. They helped us build trust with the families over the years. I remember one of the co-chairs telling me that the family group had one goal in mind, to ensure that the loved ones would be, that their loved ones would be living in a new place with services and surroundings that were as good as or better than what they had in Valley View Center. 
At the end of seven years, all the families they represented shared amazing stories about how much better their loved one's life was when living in a home of their own in the community. At the planning sessions, we also had transition consultants present, which was helpful to sharing a consistent message with the family. Many families experience a great deal of anxiety and mistrust during the planning meetings. This was an opportunity to build trust with the individuals and the families and to understand where people were at. Valley View Center residents, regardless of ability, were able to participate in their individual meetings. It also provided an opportunity for families to express their anxiety, their concerns and their hopes and their fears for their loved ones. So this is the last slide that you're looking at right now. I'd like to read a personal note from Carol, who was the chair of the Valley View Center Legacy Group. And this note was taken from their 2019 November newsletter. The picture you're looking at right now is not her brother. It is someone enjoying his new home. And what I edited out was his best friend from the center who lives with him, who was right next to him. He was having a beer. So this is Carol's note. My brother has been living in his new Regina home for a year now. While we look forward to having him nearby, we had feared the adjustment would be difficult for him. We could not have been more wrong. He adjusted quickly to his bright new home. The caregivers quickly adjusted to um, and learned to appreciate his sense of humor and continue to encourage him to enjoy new experiences. He will be forever grateful to the Valley View staff for the care that, he gave, that they gave him during his time in Valley View and during his transition. Our gratitude goes to the Transition Steering Committee who worked with such dedication to ensure all residents received the supports they needed in their new homes. His success has brought us joy and peace of mind. That's Carol's note. I will end by saying the Valley View Transition's dedication the Valley View Transition team's dedication to putting individuals first, having champions and involving families ensured a very successful transition. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Janet, over to you, we can see you. Do you wanna- uh, Could I have the first slide up please? Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, you know, on January 29th of 21, uh, the Manitoba government announced that the Manitoba Developmental Center would close by 2024. Uh, it was an announcement that we had been advocating and waiting decades to hear. Finally, our government stepped up with the courage to do the right thing. As a society, we must guarantee future generations of people with intellectual disabilities and their families that we will never create institutions again. The first step is abolishing institutional care and the buildings that for many bring back traumatic memories. Next slide, please. The decision to close an institution and embrace community living requires a vision, passion, leadership, champions, and a conviction and commitment. The decision may also be made because of a critical event or a crisis. And we had both of those when Minister Rochelle Squires, just three weeks after she became the Minister of Families, made the announcement that the Manitoba Developmental Center that had existed for over a century would close. We were in the middle of a pandemic, a crisis that we had never experienced before. The COVID pandemic is revealing uh, how much greater the impact is for people in congregate living settings. Although the government had been talking about the closure for years, the minister claimed that the pandemic was the last straw. And she stated that institutional living posed uh, additional risks and furthermore that community living was more dignified and safer. The failure to provide access to care in the community is a violation of people's basic rights. Ignoring those rights leads to people being devalued and relegated to remaining second-class citizens hidden away in institutions. Tragically, for too many people, time ran out. 
people who lived most of their lives in the institution and died before the right to live in the community was recognized. Our society must recognize and reconcile the truth of what it was done to thousands of vulnerable people. Next slide, please. Manitoba, uh, it's a province situated in the center of Canada, it was one of the last two provinces to support people in large institutions. Um, the Manitoba Developmental Center, which housed up to 1200 residents since it began operating in the late 1800s, is situated on the outskirts of a very small community of Portage La Prairie and Treaty One territory. In Winnipeg, St. Amant operates River, River Road Place its history is one of being a developmental center and currently their focus is on providing transition services. They're also, uh, they operate one of the largest community residential programs in Manitoba. In 2021, there are 133 people living at the Manitoba Developmental Center and 100 people living at River Road Place. The population at MDC is aging many of them in their senior years after being admitted as children. Next vision or next slide, please. A good life in the community is possible for everyone. We had a vision, but it has taken us more than a quarter of a century after the Vulnerable Persons Act received royal assent in 1996 to live up to the promise that no one is left behind. That new law prohibited the admittance of people to an institution unless it was by court order. Next slide, please. When passion and commitment merge, leaders mobilize to use whatever tools and resources are available to achieve the goal. Passion led to the 2006 human rights complaint initiated by Community Living Manitoba and People First of Canada. The launch of the complaints started the slow trickle of people leaving the center, but there were still 250 people living there when the complaint was finally settled five years later in 2011, and 49 of the 250 people still living there would be supported to move away from the institution to communities throughout the province. The network of residential and day services organizations mobilized to welcome people from Manitoba Developmental Center to their communities. Their most recent experience had been the closure of Pelican Lake Training Center in 2000. During the year long process of supporting 90 people to move from there, uh, lessons were learned and some good practices established. Key to a successful move was the person centered approach of, to planning facilitated by independent facilitators. Next slide, please. A quarter of a century of vision and passion was not enough to close our institutions in Manitoba. It requires leadership of the decision makers to consider who is going to be the winner or loser when tough choices have to be made. When juggling, the rights of people who stand to lose the most are the ones we must stand up for. In 1996, when Manitoba proclaimed the Vulnerable Persons Act and people were prohibited from moving, um, the, the human rights case was settled. There were 200 people living there and a dec decade later, 133 people are still living there. A reporter covering a fire at the Manitoba Developmental Center in the 1980s exposed the conditions that people were living in. The Welcome Home Initiative was launched and more than 200 people moved into the community then. A critical incident led to the closure of Pelican Lake Training Center situated on the outskirts of Nynette, another small community in Manitoba's rural regions. A government employee visited clients at Pelican Lake Center and was horrified by the lack of basic care, including mismanagement of medications. The closure announcement was made and rescinded, but the truth about people's care could not be denied. And a second announcement with an allocation of resources, a change in leadership at the center, and this, it closed ahead of schedule. The community residents of the small town where the institution was located to referred to people at the center as their people when the announcement was made. But prior to that, people were not welcome at the coffee shop that was just at the bottom of the lane. And the, the center was surrounded by some of the best biking, uh, hiking paths that there were in the province, but people walked around in circles in a recreation hall. Like the Manitoba Developmental Center, 
It provided lots of employment opportunities and contributed to the local economy. And one of the biggest challenges for the leaders was the balancing of honoring the rights of people to live in the community outside of congregate care facilities and responding to and collaborating with the strong leadership of the opposition, which included some families, the unions, I think have been mentioned. Next slide, please. In the last quarter of a century, self-advocates and community advocates have been at the center of campaigns to close the remaining institutions. Our champions have come and gone over the years with the exception of one man, David Waramie. Next slide, please. And there's David. We will hear from him in a moment. Okay. David is a survivor of the institutional system. He lived at the Manitoba Developmental Center. And although he moved many years ago, he has never forgotten, nor would he let others forget the people who were still there. He has been a true leader to the rest of us. How could we slow down our efforts when he never would? He has inspired a generation of self-advocates to keep up the fight. He draws people to him, but you know, before the conversation is over, he will mention MDC and ask, when are they going to shut that place? They're gonna shut that place, David. This was not a rhetorical question for him. He wanted an answer. People first uh, members in Manitoba, as they have been across the country, have fought tirelessly to keep attention on the fact that even though the numbers were going down, a small group of people did not benefit from the vision of community living like thousands of other Manitobans with disabilities have been able to take for granted. Next slide, please. The need for strong advocacy remains as great now as it did um, at the knee announcement of the closing. Some people living at MDC may have family members who they see frequently. Many don't. Uh, considering the age of the people still living there, most of the parents have passed. Um, there may be some who have siblings, but they often are living away from the province as well. And we have to remember that life as people have known it for decades will be changing. And more than ever, they need to be surrounded by people who know how to listen deeply to get to know them, what they need, and what their preferences are about everything. People who believe in the possibility of a good life for everyone. And while others may say that living in the community is safer, it may not feel that way for some people, and they may be afraid. People communicate their fears in different ways, but it is never about them not adapting to their new home. It's about them having to work very hard to adapt to a new environment after leaving everything that is familiar behind, including the people in their lives. There is no ending to this story of the journey. People will change as their new life emerges with genuine and thoughtful person-centered individualized planning. They need to have hope that the people who are working with them will get it right about the place where they live and with whom they share their life in their home. People may change their mind, we all do. And good support is needed every step on the journey towards that vision of a good life. So now I'm happy to turn it over to uh, David and um, Lita. Thanks so much, Gloria and Janet. And I will also, I will turn it over. I will just do a quick introduction of them if that uh, before I do. Um, and thank you both for really powerful um, stories about the process of closure. It's, um, I think, an enormous and rich um, experience to share with the, the all of the participants who've joined us today. Um, the next panelists uh, who are joining us are uh, David Waramie, who's already been um, introduced uh, in the last presentation, and Letta Jarvis. Um, both who are institutional survivors and both who are members of Deinstitutionalization Task Force. Um, and Shelley Fletcher, who's the Executive Director of People First of Canada. Thank you guys and welcome. Thank you, Connie. Can you hear me and see us okay? We can hear you and see you. All right, okay, David and I wanna start by saying that we're coming to you today um, on the ancestral lands 
Treaty 1 territory, traditional ter territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and we are on the homeland of the Métis Nation. So we want to start today. We're, Shelley, gonna... we're getting some feedback. I'm not sure if it's on your end. I'm just going to ask Mark. I don't know if it's if others are getting a strong feedback, but it's quite loud. Yeah, we can get the feedback. I think it's because uh, David actually has like his his mic on as well, okay. or it might be okay. video on. There's there's a couple screens there, so if one of them's okay. turned off, we should be okay. Yeah. All right. It seems to have died down there, Shelley. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Is that better? Yeah. It's much better. Yeah. Much better. Thanks. Turn off one of his. Okay. So we're gonna probably to leave the call. You have to leave call. Thank you. We're gonna we're gonna probably scale this a little bit. Where I know we're running short on time, and there's some great, looks like there's some questions in the in the question and answer period we want to get to. So I'm gonna just start by saying um, I'm gonna start by sharing the the National Task Force definition of an institution. An institution is any place in which people who have been labeled as having an intellectual or developmental disability are isolated, segregated, and or congregated. An institution is any place in which people do not have or are not allowed to exercise control over their lives and their day-to-day -day decisions. An institution is not defined merely by its size. I'm gonna introduce Lita to you now. Lita is a passionate speaker and advocate. She lives in Eastern Canada in her own apartment with her dog and many friends. Lita is the past president of her local People First chapter. When Lita was seven years old, she was put in her first institution. Over the course of her life, she's been in seven different institutions. These were difficult years filled with abuse and neglect. Lita wanted to be part of a community. She didn't feel like she belonged in those places. Lita's gonna start this right now, just reading you again, the definition of an institution, but she's gonna read it in plain language. Lita? Okay. A institution is any place where people like me and David are put. We cannot go where we want or when we want to go somewhere. We can see who we want. We don't want to be there. A institution is not about the side of the villain. It's about having control of your lives. It's about us making choices and making our own decision and having the right to support to do that. That's great, Lita, thank you. All right, we're going to start right now. We're just going to talk to David for a little bit here. Okay, Dave? Yeah. All right. So after being forced to live at the Manitoba Developmental, Developmental Center for 18 years, David finally won his fight for freedom. Currently, David lives in his own apartment in central Canada in Manitoba. And after a long battle, is proud to no longer be a ward of the public trustee. David is in complete charge of his life now, but it wasn't always that way, was it, David? When you, when you left the institution for the very last time, where did you go? My mom. You went to your mom's house, right? No. And you lived with your mom for a while. Yeah. Yeah, how was that? Good, good. Yeah, it was good. But, and then you decided it was time for you to move away from your mom's house, right? My mom was sick. Your mom was sick and you and you wanted to be more independent, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you moved, where did you move then? Into a group home. Into a group home. Yeah. How was that? Not, no, not good. It was not very good, eh? Why was it no good? You couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't go anywhere? No. Did you have did you have freedom there? 
No. What kind of rules did they have did it, that made you think you couldn't be free? You had to come home already. You had to come home when they told you to? Yeah. Yeah. Could you eat whatever you wanted? No. No. Could you go to bed whenever you wanted? No. Could you, you couldn't leave whenever you wanted? No. Did it feel much different than living in an institution? The, the staff were no good. Yeah, the staff were no good, right? No. Oh. Yeah. Why were they no good? Mm -hmm. Did they, they put rules, right? No. Yeah, come closer to me, please. Can you come close to me? They had lots of rules there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so you lived in that group home for, for a while, right? Yeah. And you did not like it. No. And how did you get out of that group home? Do you remember? No, no, really. I don't know how. Who helped you? Did your social worker help you? <laughs> no, really. Yeah. And Tara. Right? Yeah. So David, can we tell people, can we tell people right now, who's the boss of your life now? I am. You are the boss, right? <laughs> And you feel like you have full control of your life now? Yeah. And is this the life you want to be living? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, David. Okay. We're going to listen to Lita now. Okay. Okay. All right. So, oh, oh, he's going to try. Oh, anyways, um, Lita, I'm pretty much going to ask you the same question, Lita. Can, no, no, no. can you, um, can you, can you tell us what happened when you, um, I know you were in and out of institutions, but there was, and you had lots of different experiences of, of when you left the institution. Can you, can you share one of those experiences with us, please? Well, one of the experience I had was, uh, I went to this institution, I was there for a while. They gave me shock treatment and that, and one time they came to me and they told me, that I have to leave, they can't help me no more and that. And I asked them if they would go give me some money where I can buy food or, or get an apartment for myself and that. I said, because I'll be out there by myself. And they, they told me that was my problem to do the best I can and that. So I went out in the community and I went down the wrong, wrong track and that. I started drinking and doing drugs, and uh, there was no support for me at that time, and there was nobody that cares and cared that for me, and my family did not want to have anything to do with me. And I had too much freedom. Lita, can I just quickly ask you to turn your camera on, please? <laughs> There we go. Thank you. So you had too much freedom, quite the opposite of David's experience. When he left, he was, he, he was put kind of back into, a, into a, a small, a group home that felt like an institution. And your experience is quite the opposite. Yes. You had too much freedom and that did not, no, 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 no. that did not go well. That did not go well for you, did it? That did not go well for me. I didn't know what way to turn in that. And I was a very lonely person, very upset. Uh, I didn't know where I would go to turn to. My family didn't want me because I had an in and out with disability. And then the institution kicked me out in that. And I, I, I just did not know where to turn to at that time. But now I'm more happier because I'm in with people first and I can do, I can go and do a lot of presentation and that, and I can be strong and that, and give people my story and that, especially young boys and girls that is on their way to go down the wrong road and that I can give them my story and tell them where I've been at and how I'm doing now.
That's awesome, Lita. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. I, we're going to wrap up now. I just want to thank you both for, for telling us the story. We've heard today throughout the session today, we've heard the right way to do this. And, and you guys have shared some stories on, on the wrong way and, and how without proper support, when you leave an institution, um, you could be set up for failure. And so thank you both for sharing your stories with us. And I know that as David says, he's gonna keep talking about this until the last institution closes and people have come home. So we'll, we'll end there. Are we good? And I'm just, yeah. Sorry. I'm the same way, Shelly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to people in that too. They don't have any institution anymore. I'm fighting for my brother. And I'm going all the way with my brother, and I, I want my brother out of the institution. Good. Thank you, Lita. Thank you, David, Lita, Shelley. Really powerful stories, and it takes an enormous amount of courage to share them. And I know that you, by you sharing them, you're giving people hope uh, in other parts of the world about their own journeys. So uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn over in a moment um, to Krista Carr, the Executive Vice President of Inclusion Canada. Uh, just before I do that, I know that the um, program says that we will end at 4.15, and it is now just about 4.15, but we are able to continue on a little bit. So please uh, do stay on and keep uh, with us on your, and add, we have a, a good set of questions in the Q&A, which we'll, I'll hand over to Krista. And just um, as I'm doing that, I want to say thank you again uh, for uh, this fantastic session. You will all know, or many of you will know, that the UNCRPD committee is holding consultations um, around the world with people uh, and self-advocates who've experienced institutions. Um, your stories will help to um, create guidelines that will help people close institutions in all parts of the world. So thank you, um, and you will also know that one of the people leading that process at the UNCRPD is Sir Robert Martin. Many of you know him through the People First Movement and Inclusion International Networks. Um, Sir Robert is also a survivor of institutional living uh, in New Zealand, and he's now a member of the UNCRPD committee fighting to close institutions. So your voices do matter uh, and they make a huge difference. So thank you very much. Krista, over to you. Um, really a fantastic set of presentations. Thanks, Connie. Uh, I think we're going to let you moderate the Q&A, but I'm just going to make some very, very brief wrap-up wrap comments that, I have, that I'm going to try to keep as short as possible. My name is Krista Carr. I'm the Executive Vice President of Inclusion Canada. What a great session. Thank you so very much to the panelists for sharing their expertise and experience with us today. And a special thank you to Ambassador Bob Ray for his fabulous opening remarks, a definite champion for community living. We know that institutions are not in the best interest of persons with an intellectual disability or anybody else really for that matter. We know that institutions isolate and congregate people, and we know that whether they be large or small, they deny people a right to life in community, a life in community to which they have a right. The pandemic that we have all lived through this past year has certainly reinforced and illustrated just how vulnerable people were who continue to live in institutions of all their various shapes sizes and forms. And on a global scale, we still permit hundreds of thousands of citizens with an intellectual disability to remain sentenced to lifetimes of imprisonment in institutions. We have failed to tra translate our lessons learned into policy and practice. And we have failed to do what we know we can, what can and should be done. So we know that it's imperative that we close institutions and we also know how to do it well and how to do it right. So again, in closing, thanks to the sponsors of this event, Inclusion Canada, Inclusion International, People First of Canada, to the panelists and to all of you for attending. And with that, Connie, I'm going to turn it over to you to moderate the Q&A. Okay, uh, I was not anticipating doing that, but we do, let's take a few minutes. Um, I'm going to rely on Mark and Kurt who are uh, tracking the, the questions in the chat box, in the Q&A. We have had a few of the questions that people have posted answered. Um, one was, um, what is the definition of an institution? And I should say that um, 
Inclusion Canada and People First of Canada's definition, which Shelley um, and Letta gave you, uh, is, is the definition that Inclusion International has adopted at the international level. So if you would like a copy of that, we're happy to share it again in writing with the participants. Um, we see a number of questions in the chat box um, about how people um, can be supported as individuals in person-centered planning. Um, some very, very complicated and detailed questions about the advocacy uh, process that people, um, oh, Mark's gonna jump on and help me out here with some questions. Um, Mark, can I get you to turn your camera on and help me? I'll stay on if I can help at all, but I think if you wanna direct some questions to the panelists, yeah, I can just pose a couple questions here. That's I'm just right. going through the Q&A right now. Let me just take a quick look here. So one of the good questions from an anonymous attendee was, have there been any initiatives that provide trauma-related support to survivors of institutions? So I don't know if anyone can speak to it on the call, uh, but I'm sure we can we can chat about that a little bit. Shelley, anyone on your side who wants to tackle that question? I would kind of turn that to Gloria because they've gone through the closure process and I know people were quite well supported when they were coming out of the institution. Gloria, did you have anything set up around, sure, um, around that piece? Of yes, so um, currently we have uh, staff from Inclusion Saskatchewan. Um, they're still in contact with 153 that moved out of uh, Valley View and they're, they're there for support, but our government has also created what they call the trauma team. And if um, somebody in their new home is experienced trauma, is experienced trauma, then they'll go out and assist uh, their support workers and the individual living in their new home, um, hopefully to make things better. So that's what, I mean, that's a short answer for what we're doing right now in Saskatchewan. Perfect. Thank you so much. We have one question here, um, more of a general question about have we encountered difficulties with society and communities accepting people with disabilities living in their neighborhoods? So they're kind of curious about how do we advocate and raise awareness in society about deinstitutionalization and the need for people to live in the community uh, with if they have a disability? So Again, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just go first and then leave, give it to other panelists. But oh my goodness, this was huge, especially when we started building the new 38 homes in our province. People put up petitions. Um, they went to their mayors. They oh they 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 were so against people. For, I don't know why they just they just were. But we we called it not in my backyard, NIMBY. So um, what we did is. Um, we actually went to mayor and council's meetings. Um, so we were recorded. We brought people uh, that had moved out, individuals that had moved out of the institution with us. We went to the homes where they were going to be built, these new homes, and we had yard parties. We um, let the neighbors get to know who their new neighbors were going to be. And it just, it was a lot of work, um, but it worked perfectly. Um, and, and then it stopped. Uh, when, once he got to know, it's, it's, it's like you and I, when we get a new neighbor, who's that guy next door, right? That same, the same type of feeling goes through, um, went through some of the people, some of the neighborhoods. It wasn't all the neighborhoods, but some of them, some of them did. I'll leave it to uh, somebody else to continue Maybe on. Maybe I can just uh, uh, pile on here, just to say that um, uh, w w there was one case of a community in Toronto uh, that had a, a, a meeting with attended by about 250 people. And they were opposing the, the, uh, the creation of a group home next to them. And I went, you know, which is a, a very, very uh, dangerous thing to do. You know, they say, you know, the Yes Minister programs, they talk about saying that would be courageous. Well, I turned up the meeting. And at first it was incredibly unpleasant. And I said, look, uh, what are you worried about? And the people thought it was going to be drugs. And, and I said, what kind of a group home do you think we're talking about? 
And they said, well, you know, there's going to be kids coming in from jail. And I said, no, wait a minute. What, what, what makes you think that, uh, you know, we're going to have at max eight people um, and uh, most of them are not able to move around very much. And those that can go outside with the help of the caregiver. And then they said, oh, well, then it's going to be, you know, we're going to be living next door to people and we don't know, we don't want to have them around. I should have said, really? So it was a horrible meeting and it was really challenging. And I came away from that very upset. And I talked to the local member of the legislature who was with me and he said, leave it with me for a bit. Uh, he went to see the local, uh, local church. He went to see the priest. Uh, he said, I'd like to use the church as a base where we can talk about pictures, showing pictures of people. Uh, do some, uh, of, of just give people a sense of who's actually coming. And it was very interesting, five years later, I was campaigning with the same member of the legislature. He said, I want you to come and campaign with me in the neighborhood where the group home is. I said, are you sure? He said, yes, I'm sure. And I went and next door to the group home, they had a neighborhood meeting and they invited all the people from the group home to the neighborhood picnic. And there was cakes and pies and just all sorts of celebration. And people came over to me and it was the most moving thing. They were, they were apologizing saying they didn't understand. They, they were fearful, they were afraid. And uh, the priest was there and he said, it took a while, but we, you know, we, we worked it out and we really tried to turn, turn heads and minds and most importantly, hearts. Because turning hearts is really one of the key things to do. And I think that's, that's part of what you need to do is you really need to open up people's hearts to the meaning of disabilities of all kinds. And then accepting the fact that this is just part of being human. And, uh, that we're all in this together. And I think that's a very powerful, uh, and people are, people get, you know, feel, can feel that. They, they're, they're not, most people are not nasty. You know, they just don't necessarily know or understand. I, I think it makes a huge difference to do the outreach that uh, Robert and, uh, and, and company described. I think it's really, really important to, to kind of figure out how to, how to do this right. Um, but it has to be done. And, uh, when you think about it, somebody just talked about a home being closed in 2024. In Ontario, we started closing them in the 1970s, really took hold of the 1980s and through the 90s. This has been a, um, a half century of a process that we've been going through in Canada. We're not there yet. So, you know, getting best practices and really sharing information is so critically important. Ambassador, thank you so much for staying on for the questions. Um, you told us a story in a recent meeting also about meeting a parent who initially had been opposed to having their son or daughter move out of an institution and their reaction um, years later when the person had moved successfully into the community. Would you share that as well? Well, she's a very good friend of mine. And uh, she, she, wasn't, she did, wasn't a good friend of mine when I was premier. Uh, and when we had to make this decision uh, and to you know, keep moving people and finding better places. And she admitted that she'd been part of a letter writing campaign, which of which I received several, saying, don't close, don't close, don't close. And uh, she literally came over to my house after I'd got to know her a little bit because she was a neighbor of mine. And uh, she said, I, I want you to know that I was wrong, you were right. Um, and we were just afraid. We were afraid of change. Uh, we thought he'd be less well cared for than, than in, uh, in the Smith Falls facility. Uh, we thought it would be, you know, it would be less care. In fact, he's in a small group home. He has to, he's in a group home because he's really both physically and mentally very challenged. Uh, intellectually, you know, in terms of his development, very, very challenged, but he's still, still living well into his 50s, getting good care, can connect with people. I visited him there a few times my, myself. Uh, he can, you know, he can, he, can, he can connect very well with the people that he knows. And she said, he's much better off here. He's much happier here. This is his home. Uh, Smith Falls wasn't a home. It was a big, a big facility, a big institution. This is all. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Norman, I see that you turned your camera on. Did you want to jump in? 
actually. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I actually have a great deal of difficulty with uh, neighbors deciding who can move into their neighborhood. Um, on And I've lived in the neighborhood that I'm in now for probably 30 years. And, and in one home next to, uh, to us, uh, I think there's been three or four uh, people, uh, families that have moved in. And I've never once had uh, been given the opportunity to talk about who should live next to me. And, and I don't think um, it's appropriate for communities to uh, complain about uh, a person with an intellectual disability or a de developmental disability moving in next door. I, th I think the part of the problem is the models that we choose to provide um, for people to live in the community. So if, if we build large group homes, for example, of six, seven, eight people, the community is going to, to probably respond in, in a negative way. But if, if we provide opportunities for people to live in typical homes with a, the kind of the typical number of people that live in a home in that community, you don't really get uh, any kind of negative response from, from the community. I have, uh, I, I know that there are some people living in a home uh, about a block and a half from me when they moved in. Nobody said anything. We didn't even realize that there were going to be um, people with disabilities living there with supports. They've been wonderful neighbors, but nobody in the, in the neighborhood uh, raised any concerns at all. Thanks, Norm. Mark, do you want to, uh, are there any other questions you want to try to get to or you think we're running out of time? Uh, I was thinking I have one more question <laughs> that I'll pose to everybody here. Um, and it was a kind of around uh, the, the move back towards smaller institutions in the country. So we saw in during the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm thinking of you know, Participation House in Markham, which was just ravaged by COVID. And it was a group home that was con constituted about 45 beds. And we're seeing there's a bit of a trend uh, of, uh, in different parts of the country where we're seeing these group homes with larger and larger capacities being built, which are kind of smaller institutions. Um, the, this question is really just about how, how do we counter that? How do we counter that narrative? How do we how do we get the public aware of why this is dangerous, and uh, what can we do to to stop that that kind of finding that middle ground between large institutions and group homes where it's it's still an institution by any other name? I'll jump in for a second. I just want to say, like this is this is why it's critically important that we bring it back to the definition of an institution institution and, and Article 19 around choice um, and, and not open beds. It's not about an open bed in a community that, that we're going to fill. And, and, and if we're going to be true to the work that we're doing as a disability community, we need to stay true to that definition. And we need to accept nothing less other than people having choice, having voice, having um, and choosing where they want to live and being supported to do so. Otherwise, you're right, we're just seeing institutions under different names, under different models, they look pretty, it's an inclusive town, the whole town is where you live, work and play on the same grounds. That's an institution, I don't care what you call that, it's an institution. And so we, we need to be holding governments accountable and um, organizations accountable to stop building them. It should not be an option. That I think that's an excellent way to wrap up, Mark, if you agree. Um, I'm sure there are other questions that people, um, we will tackle some of the questions possibly by sharing information from the session, Mark, uh, with participants. Um, please, if you want to know more about the work that's happening in Canada, be in touch with Inclusion Canada and People First of Canada, and they can put you in touch with many of the people who were on this panel. I wanna say thank you again for a really tremendous uh, set of presentations uh, and especially um, to the um, institutional survivors for sharing their stories, uh, very powerful stories and very much appreciated. And thanks again, Ambassador, um, for staying with us and uh, for participating in the discussion. Thank you all and have a good rest of the week.